This Tesla or Something is brought to you by Audible.com. Hello, everyone. You're looking at a post-GDC, Adam. Actually, it's really more of a post watching UCLA actually make it to the Sweet 16 when they're going to play Florida. I understand there's a lot of Gators fans out there, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep some hope tucked away, maybe in my back, because one of these days it's going to happen. Anyhow, uh, basketball aside, even though that's really where most of my mind is this week, uh, GDC. Um, you probably saw a couple of videos I had uh, regarding VR. I was even talking about Assess or something this week, but with the much anticipated reveal of Project Morpheus from Sony, obviously the newest iteration of the Oculus, and even a smaller device I saw, which I'm going to talk about, called the Seabright, and obviously something that Valve may have that is you know, yet to be kind of envisioned or seen by the rest of the world. Um, yeah, VR is something that is really happening. As I've said before, I, I, I have more confidence that there's something here than say the 3D initiative that happened a few years back that was really kind of put forward by Sony because they make TVs that have 3D in them and they needed people to buy some things. Um, this feels like something entirely different that is worthy of attention because it, it opens up some fascinating questions and issues and opportunities in terms of game design. Um, and I, I, I think everyone I was mentioning, we're talking on the Twitter in the comment section, uh, I can't wait to play game X on this. And that's the part that I'm not excited for. I like Fallout. I don't think Fallout will be that deeply enhanced if I'm in a virtual reality setting of it. Um, it, it really, what I felt in my experiences playing it is, while I did want some interactivity, but especially based on my friend's game, Narcosis, who I sat down and I played with on the Oculus, it was like an underwater survival horror game. I think there was some combat that I never really engaged in, but the sheer novelty of being underwater in that kind of VR setting, which my brain had completely bought into, was so fascinating in and of itself that I didn't see that there was much of a need for combat. Um, you know, because I think we really use a lot of that cause and effect that combat really is in our video games to create immersion in a setting that can really throw you out of it. That level of engagement, hitting the button, watching something happen on screen, doing a bunch of combos, that requires you to stay focused, you get that immersive feel. Here, the immersion isn't, doesn't require much on the active participation of, uh, of, of the player because you actually have a technology that's doing that for you. And that opens up such fascinating ideas for game design, where we don't have to rely upon this challenge, upon this, uh, these, these kind of rote activities to keep it engaging because, well, I've never been underwater and I don't expect to go there. I've never been to space. I don't expect to go there. That doesn't mean they, they can't be fun, but there is already such an innate appeal without having to use the tried and true gameplay mechanics that we're so used to in a regular console game. And what I also think this can open up is trying to elicit some emotions that really games have not been really good at ever, like empathy. That uh, while maybe it you know, might not be a unique geographical location, what about something like a time period? Say the Great Depression. Say something happening during the Black Plague. You know, once again, with your brain buying that situation, yes, it may not be historically accurate to a T, but you suddenly have a sense of understanding, of relating, and maybe caring about other characters in ways that we have to really do in traditional games through narrative tropes that we're all so accustomed to. I think that, once again, there's just such wonderful opportunities to move in the directions that games need to, which is a more thoughtful way to help counterbalance the very enjoyable action games that are pretty much, you know, 80% of what we talk about here. Now, I have spoken at length about what the cost of these games are going to be, and I think that's still my biggest question. Everything that we've seen, are very small snippets of game that offer a very kind of very contained piece of gameplay. Um, given the things that you have to take into consideration on a, just a technical level, how big a game could you really have? If you're going to plump down money for a Project Morpheus, how big a game can a developer make and that might cost three times the rate of what a normal game is with probably a lot of risk attached to it as well. But this is where I think it's going to be a hard sell both for Morpheus, both almost for all of these VR headsets. It's the way you look. I was at an event uh, last Monday night and I saw three people sitting next to each other wearing the headset playing a game. And I imagine they were enjoying themselves. But I have probably what is the closest to the sensation of future shock. Uh, when you are in what is fundamentally a sensory deprivation chamber, it's very alienating to the other person. 
uh, in a very dislocating way. It wasn't some, a conscious thought, it was a sense of discomfort. That that person was there, but for all intents and purposes, he was not there, and if I needed to talk to him, if there was to be any engagement, there is this very clear visual image saying, I cannot be engaged with. And all I could think of is, if my wife came home to find me in that state, I don't think we're starting off the evening on the right foot. Um, it's something that, I think it's going to have to be addressed that there's a correct setting and a way that we present how these games should be um, consumed because there is something starts to get into a sci-fi territory that I never thought I would see before. Uh, now, there was one device. It was called a Seabright, uh, far more low-powered. It actually ran the images off of a cell phone. And this, you could see the person's eyes because you were actually viewing the game through a reflector that was down here. You know, it was kind of like what we use our teleprompters for. Um, it was interesting watching someone play that because I felt that, hey, if there was a crisis, if there was danger, if I needed to convey something to them, that there was an awareness. Um, and I, I know I probably sound way too cautionary and paternal in saying that, but uh, get in a room with people playing Oculus and let me know what you think. On the topic of immersion, uh, probably the most low-tech way you can do it is through a book. Obviously, there are more high-tech ways now to consume a book because you can listen to them being read and that's Audible. So go ahead and sign up for Audible. They have over 100,000 audiobooks and spoken word entertainment in every genre to be downloaded to your phone or MP3 player and playback anywhere, anytime. Uh, on the idea of kind of empathy with something that you are not familiar with, I would like to recommend a book I just picked up, Margaret Macmillan's The War That Ended Peace. It's about the era of World War I, but the events in the world that led up to 1914, not the far more, you know, typically tread turf of what happened between 1914 and 1918. Started reading it a couple days ago, cannot put it down. You can go to audiblepodcast.com slash something to get a free audiobook download when you sign up today. You'll get to hear the smart words and it'll help your brain. And you'll be supporting Rev3 Games. All right, uh, I'm gonna answer a very interesting question from uh, someone who goes by TEC. And he asks, do you think Titanfall might finally awaken the game industry to the fact that enhanced creative movement, like Assassin's Creed, Mario Sunshine, Dishonored, is such a huge factor in fun gameplay, not unrestricted movement, like Prototype or Saints Row 4? Um, it's a really interesting question. While I don't know if Titanfall will be the wake-up call, um, there is something about the new freedom in motion that isn't you can go anywhere. Um, it's interesting having just played both Titanfall and Infamous, which, while not completely, does allow you uh, a freedom of movement that's up there with the prototype or a Saints Row 4. And I, I think some of this comes down to where, it's a philosophy I have of creativity, that if you uh, try to do something with a blank slate, it becomes quite paralyzing, and sometimes there's, there's something almost more imperfect than allowing restrictions on the creative person that you have to navigate. And I think that's a good way of looking at the two different types of traversals that those games offer. Um, I think traversal in a game is incredibly important. It's something that should be looked at more and more and more, because those are your fundamental controls. That is, as we were talking about earlier with the VR, how you get into that immersive state. What you're doing here innately with your hands and how it's being responded to on screen. That is the core of the fantasy, and it's something that should be explored. You know, we talk a lot about, is it next gen enough? Is it next gen enough? It's these more subtle things that are gonna help define the next gen, not something that's so blatantly obvious. New ways of motion that offer a sense of fantasy or a sense of at least novelty to give ourselves that moment that's special because we've never had it before. 